Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hello, everyone. It's Wednesday night, and that means we are right here with you for Friends in Fiction. We have an amazing evening ahead of us, so let's get started. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. I'm Patty Callahan Henry. I'm Mary Kay Andrews. I'm Kristen Harmel. And this is Friends in Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories to support independent bookstores, authors, and librarians. Tonight, we'll be talking with Sarah McCoy and Chanel Clayton, and Christina Lauren will join us for the after show. Oh, but first... <laughs> Oh, but first, we're so grateful for your over-the-top response <laughs> to our new Behind the Book partnership with our friends at Fable, a free app for your phone or tablet with loads of incredible book clubs to join, including ours, Behind the Book. If you haven't joined our premium club full of behind-the-scenes info that you can't get anyplace else, it's just $5 a month to join our club, or you can purchase an annual premium all-access membership for just $70 for the entire year to join all of the premium clubs on Fable, including LeVar Burton's book club. So visit fable.co backslash friends and fiction to sign up today. And this month we're reading my new book, The Homewreckers. Yay. Speaking of The Homewreckers, I'm telling you, give a girl a fourth week on the New York Times list and she doesn't think she has to talk on cue anymore. <laughs> I'm going to have to read the script. Like, she's like, whatever. I write the script. I, mm -hmm. I'm writing the script for life here. Week yeah. number four. We're not to that part yet. We're not to that part yet. Oh, it's a no, secret. No, no, talk about that. It's a secret. Oh, sorry. Okay. So you've heard that the four of us are on the road together, right? So we have one event left this season, which is a chance to see us all together. We were at the Jersey Shore just a couple weeks ago. We've also been in Cleveland and we are having a luncheon on July 21st in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. We hope you can join us on the road for this big Friends in Fiction live celebration. We're so excited for the opportunity to see so many of you in person. You can find the link under pinned posts on our Facebook page or on the Browse About Books website. And don't forget, as you know, we talk about it every week. We've talked about it since our very first show when Mary Kay was wearing her pajamas, mm -hmm. that we continue to support independent booksellers when and where we can. And one way to do that is to visit our own Friends in Fiction bookshop.org page, where you can find Sarah's books, Chanel's books, Christina Lauren's books, and books by the four of us and our past guests at a discount. So we've been hearing from you guys. We've been on, on the road that you miss our Just Us chats at the beginning of the show, and we miss them too. So we decided to bring them back. Um, and so each week, we are going to give you a chance to ask us anything, which we think will be really fun. So if you have a question that you'd like the four of us to answer or a topic you'd like us to discuss, we are all ears. doesn't have to be about books. It can be about anything. In fact, if you want to drop some in the comments right now um, for future weeks, we'll go grab them later because we want to hear from you. But first, we have some really important business to attend to. Oh. <laughs> Is it, I am not, it's not my cue. It's not my cue. One of us is having a, it's Kristen, but one of us is oh, having a really, really, really good day. So John Searles may or may not, but definitely did, have talked about MKA's new novel, The Homewreckers, on the Today Show this morning. Yeah. And so we all tuned in to make sure it was real. But if you want to go look for it, it is on our page and Mary Kay's page. And he just raved about it. 
And we just found out that she is on the New York Times list for the fourth Woo-hoo! week in a row. Yay! Cheers, Mary Kay. We are so proud, so of, proud of you. My fumble yay is falling down on the job. I don't know what to do about him. <laughs> Thank you. That's two weeks in a row. You might want to. You, huh, you might want to look into that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we are yeah. so proud of you. And Thank you guys, you. if you haven't bought the home records yet, let's keep her on that list for one more week. Go out and buy the book. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Anyway. Buy my book, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, that hashtag works, which means the rest of us are going to have to steal it. Yeah. Go yeah, I think we should. Or like oh summer begins with PCH. Or you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. well, we got so it's many. Fun. We had so many great questions this week that I had a hard time choosing this one, just one. But this one seemed really appropriate. So our friend Leslie Hooten said, "I think this is is a terrific segment. What is your energy source? I need it." <laughs> and while I'm pretty confident she was joking, I love this question, especially because. It's been a really heavy few weeks in our country. And so I thought that, ladies, I would ask you a little bit of a spin on Leslie's question. Um, What's something that gives you energy or brings you joy? I think for me, um, when I can do it, walking on the beach at Tybee, getting up, I never used to be a morning person, but if I can get up and see the sunrise, it kind of gives my day a great start. Mm -hmm. And then also, if I can be around my grandkids, that's, that's really a happy maker. Yeah. I love that. Is something supposed to give us energy other than champagne? (laughs) But no, that's That's actually a solid answer. Yeah. (laughs) And I second that. Yeah. No, uh, you know, like, like Mary Kay said, I think, um, you know, being around Noah, my son, um, I think always reminds me why we do all this, you know, for the people we love. Um, and that of course includes you guys and includes everybody out there. I mean, I think, you know, honestly, I'm exhausted after seven at seven o'clock at night. Like this is the time I'm usually winding down to get it like ready for bed. Um, but on Wednesdays, I just get this extra boost of energy because I'm here, I'm here with all of you. And it's, um, it's amazing. It's, it's a, it reminds me week after week why we do this. I think, you know, when I, when I was thinking about this and um, today I needed it and I was like, what did I do today when I just needed like a little energy, a little joy to stop moping. And it's almost always it's either reading something beautiful, listening to something beautiful or getting outside And one of the things, and I'm lucky right now because I'm in South Carolina. So when I go outside, I can go find the river. But one of the things I've been trying to do is let the sky be the last thing I see before I go to bed and to see the sun before I see my phone. And I'm kind of, I I want those two things. If if I change those two little things. Um, But yeah, the, the reading something beautiful, of course, being with family, all the other things we talked about, but it, we have to, I have to remember um, to be deliberate about it because you get in a slump wah, wah, wah. <laughs> and before you know it, you're, 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 you've lost that energy and joy. So I think being deliberate about it is important. Mm-hmm. What a good rule. I love that. I'm going to yeah. do that. That's a yeah. great rule. Yeah, it is. Um, well, all the things you guys said, um, for sure. But then, you know, I, I was thinking about this when we were in New Jersey a few weeks ago. And I mean, obviously, like it's exhausting for us to be on the road and we can't just do it all the time. But I think sometimes, you know, when we get home and, and we're writing and we're in our little cocoons and then to go out and like see our readers again and to see each other and to have that energy of like being together and like feeling everyone else's kind of passion, you know, yeah. um, I find that really, really energizing. So Anyway, well, good answers, ladies, and good question, Leslie, even if you were joking. (laughs) Um, And now let's welcome our guests for the evening, Sarah McCoy and Chanel Clayton. Yeah, we're so excited. Sarah McCoy is the New York Times USA Today, an international bestselling author of several novels, including The Baker's Daughter, Marilla of Green Gables, and an exclusive French title that I will screw up if I try to pronounce it. I'm not, Um, notice that she did not give that to me. 
I wait, yeah, but I mean, you know, you would think I write books set in France. You'd think I'd be able to pronounce it, but that was always my problem. Oh it. no, sorry. I know. We'll make Sarah do it when she comes on. After another glass of champagne. Yeah, ask me at the end. Um, Sarah's work is yeah, we'll ask Sarah exactly. Sarah's work's been featured in the Huffington Post, Real Simple, The Millions, and other publications. She also hosted the NPR WSNC Radio Monthly Program bookmarked bookmarked with sarah mccoy and she is a board member for the literary nonprofit bookmarks in winston-salem north carolina sarah previously taught english writing at old dominion university and the university of texas at el paso she lives with her husband and their fur children gilly pup and tutu cat in winston-salem <laughs> north carolina and her new novel mustique island was just published early last month our next guest, Chanel Clinton, is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of several novels, including Things I Can Pronounce, The Last Dream <laughs> to Key West, The Most Beautiful Girl in Cuba, the, which is such a great title, it's and awesome. Next Year in Havana, which was a Reese Witherspoon book club pick. During her childhood in Florida, Chanel grew up on stories of her family's exodus from Cuba following the events of the revolution. Her passion for politics and history has continued. Chanel studied in England and she earned a bachelor's degree in international relations from Richmond, the American International University in London, and a master's degree in global politics from the London School of Economics and Political Science. She also received her Juris Doctor from the University of South Carolina Law School. School of Law, sorry. Her new novel, Our Last Days in Barcelona, was just released on May 24th. So Sean, let's bring on Sarah and Chanel. Hi, lady. Hi, lady. Oh, oh, gosh. gosh. I'm in the back. I know Chanel's from with me in the back in the green room. Where I am just what an intro with that question. The what brings you joy? I'm like in tears. I'm look reaching for. Reaching oh. for I'm like, oh my gosh, I love these women. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, well, I think I think that has to be the first question for you guys too. Then, yeah. what brings oh, you joy? Yeah. Sarah, it's hard as all. Well, I loved what you said, Patty, about being deliberate. And I think that joy, um, you know, we choose in every moment how we're going to, even if it's a terrible moment, we are choosing how we're going to face that moment. And so I think being deliberate and choosing joy is the first step to then having choice. So, and I totally agree with you. I just was texting Patty earlier today and I was outside in my garden and I said I was troweling the ground and it's cheaper than therapy. And <laughs> that brings joy is being outdoors and being totally disconnected from any kind of um, technology. Mm -hmm. I, and just having that moment where it's you and the sky and the dirt and yes. nature and you're grateful to just be alive and breathing and being in that moment is more than good enough. And that yes. brings me such joy to know that I am good enough and I'm worthy enough in this moment just by being here. Yeah. And I think that's important for everyone to find that sphere in whatever world you're in, where you can kind of buffer yourself and say, I'm worthy and I'm good enough just by being here. And so find that, that's the joy right there to find that. that. I love that. That's yeah. awesome. Well, while you're talking and then we're going to, and then we'll ask Chanel the same question. Can you tell us a little bit about Mystique Island? Give us like the elevator pitch while we've got you. Sure. Um, Mystique, and I, I've, I've done enough of these that my elevator pitch is so terrible because it's not <laughs> like one or two sentences. And I'm, I'm going to try to do like a real elevator pitch. <laughs> so, um, okay, well, first off, I had the Southern um, Independent Booksellers Alliance. At, they did a nice little feature on it. And they I'm going to steal from them because I liked their pitch. They said, it's Fitzgerald's Tender is the Night meets Fantasy Island. And I was like, oh, that's the elevator pitch. That's great. That I can't Love it. But, um, it's about the island. So that's the namesake of the book, Mystique Island, in 1972. And onto it comes a woman named Willie May. 
And she's an ex-Texas beauty queen, recently divorced, and she shows up on the island, which is privately owned, and it's a celebrity island that caters to and has residents on it that are of the likes of Princess Margaret, Mick Jagger, and these all are real people and real characters that show up on the island in the book. And so she comes into this and um, is navigating this celebrity world and this scandal and um, who she wants to be in renewing herself on this island in the midst of all this. And then she brings her two daughters over, um, Hilly and Joanne, who are also trying to figure out who they want to be in the world in the 1970s when women's movement was coming of age um and they're struggling to find who they need to be want to be have to be and what makes them worthy so um that's the quick that's Love awesome it. that's Love awesome it. yeah well chanel we're so excited to have you here tonight so will you start off by telling us what brings you joy and then telling us a little bit about your brand new release our last days in barcelona Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and to, to chat with everyone. Like Sarah, I was sitting through the intro and it seems like such a fun group um, to be a part of. So I'm so thrilled to, to be able to be a guest this evening. So thank you. Um, in terms of things that bring me joy, you know, I'd probably say reading is kind of the thing throughout my lifetime that has really been um, kind of an escape when I've needed it, um, a, a source of comfort and solace. I often find that you know, I'll go to those favorite books that I've had over the years and kind of reread in times um, when I'm stressed out or upset about something. Um, so books have really been, you know, such a source of joy for me and, and such a comfort throughout my life. So that's definitely something I'm always so grateful for. And then uh, my new book, Our Last Days in Barcelona, is the story of Isabel Perez. She is a Cuban-American woman and she travels, well, she's Cuban, but she's living in the United States. And she travels to um, Barcelona in the 1960s, and she goes in search of her sister Beatrice, who has sort of disappeared under um, kind of suspicious circumstances. She's been doing some work with the CIA, um, and so her sister's really concerned about her. And when she arrives in Barcelona, it, Isabel gets caught up in this mystery um, and starts to uncover some family secrets that date back to the 1930s and her mother's story, and that of also a cousin in the family. So there's three um, protagonists, and their stories are kind of woven together as we alternate between the 1930s and the 1960s um, with Cuba and Spain and the United States. And we learn a bit more about this family's history, but also against the backdrop of the Spanish Civil War and, um, you know, kind of the post-revolutionary period coming out of Cuba in, um, in the 60s. That's awesome. Amazing. Yeah. I got. I have to tell you, Chanel. I am. Um, I there's a book I love called Shadow of the Wind. Have you heard of it? Yes, I love that book as well. I love that book, but um, it takes place in Barcelona, mm -hmm. and I've listened to part of it on audio. And I sometimes mix up audio and reading. And in that book, they always call it Barcelona. <laughs> and I, was, yes. I was like, when she comes on, I'm going to ask her, is it Barcelona or Barcelona? So, I think, anyway. Yeah, I think that's the more authentic way to say probably. Um, I know, but I shouldn't say, yes. try it. But. <laughs> I you know, laugh. We, uh, Brian and I went to Barcelona. Um, years ago. Yeah, we were there for uh, for two weeks on Las Ramblas. We stayed. Mm -hmm. We got a little like apartment and we, my family came over, my, my parents and my, my baby brother, um, Andrew. And so we were all there in this little apartment and for the whole two weeks though, and he is such a, you know, my husband is just such a just straight, I love him, but he's just a straight white guy from, you know, America. And he's the whole time, Barcelona, we're in Barcelona. Oh. No. <laughs> oh my gosh. And so to this day, like when I hear Barcelona, I mean that's the way you okay, say yeah. it, but I think my husband preening around trying to be Thank you. Spanish. I'm gonna say Barcelona, Barcelona. Barcelona. like a <laughs> Okay, so ladies, you both write these gorgeous transportive novels that drop us right into the time and the land and a place that we want to visit. And Sarah, in Mystique Island, that place is obviously, well, Mystique Island. <laughs> in the glamorous 1970s. And Chanel, you explore Barcelona doing two very fraught time periods, the 60s and the 30s, when the country is on the brink of civil war. So the research for these novels must not have been 
must not have, have was easy. And <laughs> so, must not have been very easy. And so I'm so interested how you caught these places with such exquisite detail. Sarah, I know you wrote that the impetus, I think I read this, was a documentary. Yes. Okay, yeah. so tell us about the research and about the documentary. I want to hear about that. Yeah, I actually was watching a documentary on Princess Margaret called The Rebel Princess. And I, I have a I have kind of a crush on her. <laughs> Can you yeah. have a crush on like historical oh, yeah. girl crush? Sure. A sure. total girl crush on her. And I think you it's can on friends and fiction, Sarah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad that I'm understood and embraced here. Like that that emoticon <laughs> you get or that emoji, you get me, girls. <laughs> um so I was watching this. Uh, documentary, and I think it's because she's a princess, so that's really like prissy, right? It's prissy, and yet she's the opposite of that. She's got all this grit and darkness and like, you know, a moxie to her, and I like that those two things are in one person, and so I was watching that, and in it, it just popped up, and I was doing it for pure pleasure, like just watching because these are the things I do on a Friday night. I mean, I, that's that's who I am. So <laughs> um, it, it popped up that she was given a piece of an island by one of her ladies in waiting, uh, Anne Tennant, as a wedding gift. And I was first off, just who gets that as a wedding gift? Because, you know, I registered at like Pottery Bar and Target and she got mm -hmm. an island. So, um, so that caught my attention while I was watching and then it said that it was the island of mystique in the caribbean and my first book is called the time it's known puerto rico uh it's based in 1960s puerto rico and my mother is puerto rican so it came from a lot of family history and a lot of research that went into the islands in the caribbean during that time and i'd never heard of mystique and so that kind of graded on me because i'm type a and i like to think wrongly that i know a lot <laughs> things that I write about. And then, you know, the universe, like it likes to do, likes to remind us that we don't know everything and it's going to teach us a lesson. So um, so then I, I was like, what is this mystique? I don't know this mystique. What is this? So I did, you know, what all of us good historical fiction authors do. I Googled and uh, popped <laughs> all this information um, that was so scandalous that of course, I had to know more. And so <laughs> I started digging into what all these scandals were, who they were, what these people were, um, found out it was privately owned, that Colin Tennant literally walked onto the island and had the money and cash and bought it and bought the, the land and the industry, which was cotton, and all the homes on it, all the people that were on it. He then owned everything. And I just couldn't believe that that could happen in a modern time, which was the late 60s, early 70s, that seemed bizarre and antiquated to me. Yeah. So um, that's where the idea came from. That I started researching into it and I wanted to know more. And I already have, again, that background of Puerto Rico and the Caribbean. And I felt like this was one um, puzzle piece that was so secretive that I hadn't heard of it before. And so I was desperate to know more. And I thought people need to know more about this island and what's going on here. So um, that is how it started. That's awesome. Wow. Wow. And Chanel, I want to hear from you. How do you go about capturing these places and these time periods in such exquisite detail? Tell us a bit about your research and how you dive in. Well, thank you. So the impetus for this book um, really came from research I did for the previous book I'd written, uh, The Most Beautiful Girl in Cuba. And I was researching that book was set during uh, the Cuban fight for independence from Spain. And so I was researching quite a bit of Cuban and Spanish relations. And I just came across this mention of um, a large contingent of Cubans who went to Spain during the Spanish Civil War to fight on the Republican side. And also kind of about all the support that was going on at that time in Cuba um, for the Republicans um, fight in Spain. And I was really interested because, you know, in researching a book set in 1898, that was, you know, such a brutal conflict when Cuba was trying to become independent, you know, to go from that to just, uh, you know, less than 40 years later, having, you know, Cubans traveling to Spain to fight in um, the Civil War. I was really struck by that relationship and by the fact that um, there were kind of those close ties. And my Cuban ancestry 
kind of going quite far back um, has Spanish ties. And so I've, I've always been a little bit interested about that relationship. And so that was definitely kind of the first thing that sparked um, me looking into this time period and, and writing this book. And then also I had written When We Left Cuba, um, which features the same family that's in Our Last Days in Barcelona. It's my fictional Prez family that I've created. And um, one of the sisters at the end of When We Left Cuba goes off to Spain. She's been working with the CIA and, and that's kind of where her journey takes her. And so it just seemed like a perfect moment. Um, I had lots of readers asking me if I was going to tell the other sisters stories. And so I thought, you know, picking up where when we left Cuba left off when they're in Spain um, really enabled me to kind of look at the, the side of Cuban Spanish relations and also to pick up in this next moment in this family's history. Unfortunately, I had been to Spain before, so that was definitely really helpful um, to kind of use some of my travel experience. Although, you know, I think when we're writing in the past, um, it can be challenging because I, for example, had a marina that I had gone to thinking like, oh, of course it would be in Marbella, you know, at, at this time. And then luckily catched that um, it didn't match the 60s time period. But, you know, that's one of those things with historical fiction, you know, we, we have to look at so many different, sometimes you're like, oh, a building's here. And then you realize, you know, maybe, maybe it wasn't, or maybe something about the building changed. Or the reader tells you. Yes. 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 To, definitely. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, just lots of research, kind of trying to immerse myself in the place um, and hoping that my readers have the same experience when they read the book. Oh, that's awesome. You know, Chanel, I always have that problem with street names when I'm writing about Paris because the, the streets change so frequently mm -hmm. that you have to like check a map from the exact time period you're writing about. It's crazy. Gosh, there's yes. so many. I feel like we could do a whole show about historical fiction research wow. rabbit holes. We fall down. Yes. Right? So, no, I mean, you'll spend hours. Like, I remember depression soap. Like what did they use to make soap out of during the yes. Great Depression? It was one of my other books. I spent like hours on that because I was trying to get the scent right and, you know, make sure that I had it authentic. So yes. I once had a tangerine in Merlot Green Gables. I had them eating a tangerine and I was told that the tangerine had not come over and been planted in Canada until the following year, like oh one year goodness. off. So I was like, this is just nuts. <laughs> oh <laughs> my gosh. Oh. That is some fantastic fact checking though. That's incredible. That is, that yes. You know, oh, someone got that. Wow. <laughs> yeah, <proper. laughs> but I feel so, like the more I do that, right? Like yeah. I fall down a rabbit hole, like yeah. what would, what would the hat be called? Right. Uh, and yeah. I fall down a rabbit hole, but then I find something really cool. Yes. That yes. I might never, not even ever find out the answer about the tangerine or the building, yeah. but I end up finding something else. So I never feel like those rabbit holes are a, are a waste of time. Uh you know, That's although true. sometimes you wind up knowing more than you ever possibly need to know. Mm -hmm. Like I was telling you mm -hmm. all today about Jerusalem artichokes, also known as sunchokes. I know far more about the history of that tuber. And now so do we. <laughs> and you I mean, shared, you're, and you you're, shared you're that welcome. Is knowledge you're with welcome. all of us. You're <laughs> I, I, I live to serve, ladies. All right. So um, so both of these books, uh -huh. well, rich historical novels, ladies, are, are at their cores, the, just moving family stories, mm -hmm. which is one of the things I like so much about historical fiction. You can, you know, paint this beautiful backdrop, this beautiful time period that we kind of want to fall into. But the story at the core has to draw you in. And with both these books, it really did. So these are moving stories centered on self-exploration, second chances, forging new paths. Um, and, you know, I love the sister relationships and the mm -hmm. imperfect but ultimately loving mother-daughter stories. I mean, just relationships, those family relationships are at the heart of these books. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, did you draw on anything in your own life for creating those relationships? Chanel, do you want to go first? Because I know um, you have quite a family history that kind of connects to the books. Sure. So um, starting the, the first book that I kind of introduced, the Perez family, which was my first foray into historical fiction was Next Year in Havana, um, which came out in 2018. And that book, I was really inspired by my family's history, um, by the stories I'd grown up on, by my relationship with my grandmother. And so I, I wanted to kind of honor that, but also very much have it be a fictional family, you know, and, and be able to have that freedom to kind of explore their lives as they evolved, um, rather than, you know, making it more closer to my family's history. So I definitely would put little bits and things in there that make that connection. Um, but also really the Prez family kind of took on a life of its own. And then as the books have progressed, um, 
I've really found that the family has kind of become its own, you know, they're kind of like friends in my life or, or a different family that I feel connected to. So the characters really have um, very defined personalities, very set histories. Um, and my readers, you know, really have kind of grown attached to them and have definite thoughts and, you know, opinions about how they want to see their lives turn out and they have their favorites. And I love hearing about that um, with them. So with this book, you know, I dedicated it to my readers because I was really inspired by all the questions I was getting um, about writing more of this family. I had not intended to necessarily tell the other sister stories, and it was really that reader enthusiasm and passion that had me write Our, Our Last Days in Barcelona. So I wanted to kind of honor, you know, that excitement for my readers and try to do it justice by kind of giving them the story that I I thought they wanted after, you know, the other books and, and what they seemed to love about this family. So, so for this book, it was really um, kind of a love letter to my readers and, and a thank That's you awesome. to them for all the support. Oh, I like that. Yeah, I love that too. How about you, Sarah? Was there anything in your own life that inspired or, um, or that you drew on for these, uh, for these complicated relationships? You know, it's interesting because I have just on this tour realized that I write a lot about sisters and about sisterhood and about mothers and daughters, and I have no sisters. Oh, <laughs> no. Same with me. Yeah. Just like and Christy. I, just like Christy. Yeah. Me too. What? It's so weird. Yeah. I know. Oh my gosh, Christy, this is what I figured out just with this book. <laughs> I realized that, I mean, it kind of like is our sort of therapy is that <laughs> because I don't have sisters and I, I'm the eldest and I'm a huge believer in birth order too. So don't get me started on that topic either, but I'm the eldest and I have two baby brothers and I, I coddle them and I love them and I'm very close with them and my whole family, but i would never had sisters. And so I think that in my fiction, I live vicariously through these sisterhood characters because my whole life, I've always wanted a sister. And yet I also have, so I want a sister and I want that closeness with another female. And I've sought that in friendships. Mm -hmm. And yet in a friendship, there's always that if you go this much too far, yeah, gone, they could be gone. And, but a sisterhood is different. You could go that far. And, and what I've seen of that is in my mother. My mother is the third girl. She's, um, so she's got her two. So babies. is mine. No, oh my God. <laughs> but she's the third of four. Oh, but my mom, there are four kids in my mom's family, but she's the third and the, the last is a boy. And so she has two big sisters and I grew up with my titis watching them interact and that sisterhood and that mother dynamic with the girls. And I was always sort of wishing myself into that, that sisterhood that they had because they would be, and they're, I mean, they're Puerto Rican women. And so they would, I would like to see them for like an hour. Just yeah. like. <laughs> they, I, I know. They would be, you know, in the kitchen, we're on the kitchen, you know, doing stuff. And I would be like the fly on the wall getting to watch this sisterhood unfold. And they would break into some of the worst fights I had ever. I mean, like, oh, my gosh, I thought the world was going to end. I thought this was going to be like we would never speak to each other. They wouldn't speak to each other again. And it was like an hour later. They would be laughing and joking and throwing stuff in the pot to make arroz con pollo and it's all fine. And we're just, you know, this is sisterhood. This is, this is family. And wow. so I always, I, I loved it. There was that unconditional yeah. um, acceptance and unconditional love that I, it's not that I didn't, fi I couldn't find that with friends, but there's just that fear that, you could lose them. And I have lost friends when we just didn't agree even on like silly things. And I, yeah. so in my fiction, right, is the one place where, again, you're in that safety of I can explore these relationships. And that's why they're so complicated in Mystique Island is that these sisters, Hilly and Joanne, they have fights where it's like they say terrible things to each other. And yet, that love is so deep and rooted yeah. in that sisterhoodness that yeah. I don't know, but I want to know more as a, as the author. 
Um, and so I flesh that out through my characters and that dynamic between them and that love that just doesn't, won't ever go away. And that love between them and their mother then, and that's a different dynamic and they each have their own relationship with their mother. And I find also that I'm drawn to threes too. Yeah. And yeah. I think because there's always then that one person who feels a little left out in whatever situation. <laughs> You know, and I find that interesting too. That dynamic of threes. Um, so, I, so does is it is it drawn back to the original question? What was it? Um, was it drawn <laughs> on my on my own family, kind of, and and entirely not because I don't. I have love to, that. But I wish I did just to feel what that feels like. You know, that's awesome. Yeah, I think that's sometimes the best source for a book. That thought of what if, and then really following that thought where it goes. I love that. Yeah. Well, sometimes you just shy away from it. My yeah. mother was the youngest of three sisters, and I was the middle of three sisters. And for a long time, I resisted writing sister stories. Yeah, because I thought I, I this is too this is too close to me. I can't, you know, I don't want to explore that. It just is, and I don't want to open that Pandora's box. And I and I and I did um, last year, yeah. somewhat with the newcomer, and but I finally figured out. Okay, yeah, you can. It's okay to do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I that's really interesting because I wouldn't I think about it now self-reflecting and I think, you know, I don't write about sisters and brothers though. And I wonder why. Well, I did kind of with Marilla and Matthew and Marilla right. Green Gables, but I wonder if I shy away, like you said, Mary Kay, a little bit yeah. because it is so close and tender, right? Yeah. Some of those Yeah, the book I'm working on actually has a sister and brother um yeah. situation. Okay, so Let's talk to Chanel over to you. So in addition to your historical novel series, you've written a number of contemporary romance novels, right? Yes, I have. How? I mean, I've had people ask me that question too. How do you segue from writing? I wrote straight mystery. Then I segue to uh, women's fiction. Now I've gone back a little bit to mystery romance. How, how did you make that switch between the two genres? And how are they similar? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think part of it, just to start as being a reader, you know, what I love to read, I kind of love to write. So that that really helps me. Um, I was always a big contemporary romance fan. And then I always loved writing historical fiction. The real impetus um, for the change came from the inspiration that I had for writing Next Year in Havana. So I do tend to kind of draw from my personal life, my life experiences in all of my books, um, be they my contemporary romances or um, my historical fiction. Um, and so, you know, I hadn't really written about my Cuban identity. I hadn't written about my relationship with my grandmother and kind of how formative that was to me. And I really started thinking about what kind of story I wanted to tell and what that would look like. And it really came across for me as kind of a multi-generational um, dual timeline story where I you know, got to kind of go back in time and look at the Cuba that my grandmother told me so much about that I kind of grew up on my family's memories and, and their love for their homeland. And then also explore what it was like to um, be Cuban American and have, you know, these emotional ties to a place and, and this kind of history that's been passed down to you, but not have that same um, physical, tangible um, connection. And so mm -hmm. that was really what inspired me to write uh, Next Year in Havana. And you know, at the time, I didn't realize it was going to take me on this journey of writing historical fiction or that I was going to write more books about this family. It was just a story that I kind of felt like I, I wanted to tell for myself um, that I was very passionate about and that, you know, fortunately, my agent and my um, editor and publisher were really supportive with. And from there, you know, just from the reader support and the enthusiasm for these books, I've kind of gone, you know, on this journey. And you know, I think having the romance background has been really helpful. Um, all of my books definitely have a love story. You know, right. I, I don't always guarantee a happy ending in the historical fiction. It kind of depends. Um, so different roles than, you know, when I'm writing romance. But I love kind of exploring those personal relationships. And I think in historical fiction, you know, we have these opportunities to, to look at these really um, deep and difficult and transformative moments in history and look at them at, you know, kind of that high level, but then also look at how it affects the personal lives of, of the people that are living them. And, you know, you have babies being born, you have, you know, deaths in the family, marriages, and, and how people go about their daily life um, when the world around them is 
sort of, you know, being upended. And I think growing up, you know, coming from an exile family, you know, I definitely related to that. I saw that with my family and, and in their stories and wanted to kind of explore that more and, and capture that for yeah. the readers. Now, do you think you'll go back to romance or are you, are you solidly on the historic fiction train now? No, you like how I did that? Like the train? I liked that. Yes. <laughs> we noticed. We know your pet. I definitely still get romance ideas. So we'll see. You know, it's one of those things. Um, I have more books that I want to write than I have time probably at the moment. Yeah, I'm so I kind of just write all the ideas down and I'm like, at some point, you know, I'll get to revisit. So I still love to read romance and, um, you know, it, it's something it's kind of what started my career. So I have a special, um, special kind of affinity and, and love for it. That's awesome. Well, it's great to be multi-talented and be able to do all of those things. Yeah. Um, Sarah, in Mustang Island, you write about some very real people, including Princess Margaret and Colin Tennant and his wife, Anne, who you mentioned earlier. But yeah. then, you know, obviously there are a lot of fictional characters and protagonists in this novel as well. So I'm interested, when you got the spark for the idea for this story, how did you, like, did you know right away, like, oh, I'm going to use real people or, you know, my, my protagonists are going to be fictional or did you ever think about, you know, making your protagonists real people who had been on Mustique? So how did you decide, like, what was that process like for you? Good question, Christy. <laughs> um, they, it is actually, so Willie May, her daughter Joanne and Hilly are inspired by real people. And I pulled and met those real people in a, <laughs> I, I have this with me everywhere, but this is this is a, a memoir that Colin Tennant wrote that I got from this little tiny um, bookshop in Somerset, England. Um, and I ordered it and it came, it took three weeks to get here. And I started reading it and I thought, at the time I, I wanted to write about Mystique. And so I thought, well, let me do my research and maybe this will be a story from, Colin and Anne's perspective. Maybe that's where I'm going with this. I, I But I was open to seeing where the um, material sort of led me. And I always am looking for, um, and this is going to sound really weird and like wooey wooey, but like <laughs> that voice. I know you all know what I'm talking about. Like, yeah. there's, right? There's a yeah. voice that you're waiting, you kind of got your antennas open for, and you're thinking, Definitely. tell me, where's the story? Where's the actual story mm -hmm. in the in yeah. this muck of material that I'm wading through. And so I was reading and it just wasn't, it wasn't this guy. It wasn't that he wasn't calling <laughs> to me. We weren't, we weren't gelling, but I was reading his stuff and thinking, okay, you want me to believe this. I don't really believe what you're telling me is fact. <laughs> okay. We're going to go with this. And then I hit a paragraph that said that one of the residents that he wooed to come and buy some of the land on the island because he was going bankrupt and he needed people to come and buy pieces of his land so that way he could continue to be master and commander of the land and these people who have been living on it. But he didn't have the money. So one of the people he wooed was a woman named Billy Ray. Ah. And he was an ex beauty queen and a divorcee. And he, in earlier chapters of this memoir, he explained that he had three criteria for people who were going to come onto his island and be residents. They had to be beautiful enough by his standard, they <laughs> had to have enough money, again, by his standard. And they had to have scandal because they couldn't go home and whistleblow on the things that everyone was participating oh, in. Oh, I on. love that. <laughs> no, is my favorite rule, actually. You guys, that's how we formed Friends in Fiction, right? <laughs> yeah. like, we are here right now, right? You have enough scandal to come on. That's right. <laughs> Get the first two, but the third, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> So she, so she was a, you know, she was a divorcee, and at the time in the late sixties, that was your know, early seventies, that was hugely scandalous. Um, and so he invited her to come, and she had two daughters. And I, so again, you see how I changed her name to Willie May, and then her daughters, I completely changed their names um, because they are still alive, 
and they still have families and they still live in the Caribbean. Ah. And so to keep them very like protected and to respect them, I changed. That's where the fact, when you asked the question, you know, how did you kind of mix facts and fiction? So that's where the facts stopped. And then everything going forward from there about the girls, especially is completely fiction. Um, And then, you know, Willie Mae is it, the real inspiration for her is passed away. So I could kind of play with that and like figure her out a little differently than the other two, but I had to be very careful. And then all the, all the other real people who are in this book, it's public domain. So they've been, everything that's in the book was put out in broadsheets in the newspaper or is in the lady in waiting. Glenn or Ian Glenn Connor did a book. I know we're not to the book part yet, but <laughs> of suggesting books, but she put out a book last year, a memoir, where she told all the secrets. Mm-hmm. And I listened to the audiobook that she narrates, and it's fantastic. Now I want to go read that. It's, anyway. Right? Okay. So um, we have so many questions coming in from the audience that I think um, we might take a couple audience questions, even though we're sort of cruising on our time. So Mary Kay, will you pull an audience question? Yeah, there's so many good ones. Um, Let's see. Um, Sarah, Michelle Marcus says, did you know that the house of the real Willie Mae on Mystique is a resort called Firefly? Oh, she's nodding. She knows. I I did know. And I was booked to stay there a week. And I was going to arrive on April 1st, 2020. Oh, oh, oh. Um, <laughs> universe, you're so kind to me. So um, that didn't happen. But since then, it didn't actually make it through the pandemic. It has been closed down now. So Firefly oh. is and was a real place. It really was the real Billy Ray's house that she really did build and then became a resort. And now it's closed down. So, yeah. It's real. Bummer. Sad. Do we have time for another one? Uh, yeah. Well, Kristen, do you want to pull one for us? Or uh, 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 Kathy, if you have one, go for it. Yeah, no, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, okay. So um, Sharon Person, Chanel, is wondering if your books have to be read in order or can they stand alone? Can we read them out of order? So I have written them all as standalones. Um, as a reader, I know, you know, it's hard sometimes to keep up with a series. So I want um, readers to be able to kind of jump in um, at any time. So it's connected family members, but each of the books kind of stands on their own. And you can choose to meet the family in the 1930s with the last train to Key West, or you can meet them in the 1960s with, you know, when we left Cuba or our, or our last days in Barcelona. So I try to give those different entry points, um, especially if you have like a favorite, you know, historical time period that you like to read in. Um, so you can kind of pick up wh- whenever you want and then go back if you'd like and, and read some of the other books. Love it. Awesome. Well, if y'all will um, stop by the page, there are loads and loads of great questions and compliments too about how much they love your books. They want to know what you're writing next. They want they want to talk about how much um, they learned from reading your book. So stop by the page. But what I want is a writing tip because it's one of my favorite things every single week. So would you share a writing tip with our viewers? Chanel, can you go first? Um, So mine probably you'll have picked up, you know, by now with all the different things I've said that um, I'm a really big reader and that's really kind of my first love and and entry into books. And so I think reading um, for me is just the best source of inspiration. If I'm stuck um, with something in a scene, you know, picking up a favorite book, reading something, you know, that's kind of new to me, just something to kind of get the creative juices flowing. I feel like um, books are such inspiration for me. So I definitely recommend just reading as much as you can, um, you know, in your genre and other genres. I learned so much, you know, from other authors. We talked about romance earlier. I think romance does dialogue, you know, to such an exquisite level that I always, when I read romance, I feel like it's kind of a masterclass in dialogue. So I think really learning from other writers and, and kind of, um, you know, feeding into that love of books is, is one of the best things we can do as authors. That's good. I always, I used to say reading, writing, reading, writing, reading, writing. Now I'm trying to give better tips than that, but yes, it's the reading. So how about you, Miss Sarah? So, um, you know, there is the old 
rule of thumb, write what you know. And I'm here to say that I think that that needs a big old like, no. I think my <laughs> writing, yeah, we sorry. Any of these books, right? Sorry. Yeah, no, I think, I think my writing tip, and I know this is controversial and it could probably get me like blackballed from, I don't know, the author's real authors <laughs> of American world. Um, <laughs> I don't think you're such a fan. I'm not. I'm not. I, I've not been invited into that yet. So you can yeah, hang out with I'll, me. I'll just get a big black ball from there. But I think write what you don't know. So I didn't know this island. I think if you write what you don't know and you go into it wanting to know more and researching it and digging yeah. into it and like, like sisterhood, like I don't know it. So I want to know more. And I think that that journey of discovery for you as the writer translates into the page for the reader. And then they are then discovering along with you. And it's much more vibrant and exciting and authentic than when I've tried to write what I know, I sound very lecturery and teacherish. Like this is what I know. And I know this and you need to learn what I know because I know this. So it's much more interesting Write what you don't know. Go and explore and have fun and discover and get lost a little bit. I think that's my tip. Yeah, mm -hmm. love it. That's a good both point. of you. Awesome. Tips. Yeah, yeah just great tips from both of you. Mm -hmm. um, so if you wouldn't mind sticking around for just a second, we have more to talk about. But first, a few reminders from us. Okay, just a quick reminder of our Writer's Block podcast. We will always pop post links under announcements each time a new one drops. A new episode launches each Friday. On the last episode, Ron and Christy talked to Joy Calloway about the grand design. And this week, Ron and Christy will talk to Carter Bays about his new novel, The Mutual Friend. So we know many of you have been participating in our very first Friends in Fiction Reading Challenge organized by our friend Anissa Armstrong. This month for June, we're encouraging you to read a book from the book clubs. And if you're looking for a way to keep track of these books and your other reading, we would love to recommend our beautiful reading journal from Oxford Exchange. And the Friends in Fiction official book club is having a blast. And if you're not there, you're missing out. The group, which is a completely separate Facebook page and is run by our friends Lisa Harrison and Brenda Gardner, is now 12,000 strong. We celebrated last week with them. So Brenda and Lisa, otherwise known as PB and J, choose a book every month for them to talk about. They will have spoilers. Everybody can chime in. The author comes on. They have happy hours with our Writer's Block podcast host, Ron Block, and they keep everyone in the loop about suggested reads and upcoming releases. Their book of the month that they chose to have a chat with on June 20th is <laughs> our Mary Kay Andrews, The Home Records. So you need to pop over to the other <laughs> and join them. Um, I also was just going to say, little typo um the new podcast episode with carter bays is actually with ron and our managing director meg who is yes, like oh, right. right. oh yeah and, um, that was totally i don't know where that came from anyway i wish i had gotten to talk to carter bays because i am a big fan so anyway i'm super excited to listen to that i cannot wait well um, carter bays i mean i don't think people know his name but he was the writer for how i met your mother and now the new hillary duff one how i met your yeah. father yeah. So that'll be really fascinating. So yeah, yeah, very cool. So make sure to join us for our next episode of Friends of Fiction next Wednesday, right here at 7 p.m., where we will welcome Ger Hendricks, Sarah Pekan. I always say her name wrong. Sarah Pekanen. Right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Allie Brady, Angela May, and Mary Alice Monroe. If you are ever wondering about our schedule, it is always on the Friends of Fiction website and on the header graphic on our Facebook page. So now, Sarah and Chanel, one last question we always like to ask. What were the values around reading and writing when you were growing up? So Sarah, let's start with you. Whoa, um, that's deep actually. <laughs> <laughs> My mom is a career elementary school teacher, 40 Aww. years in the business. So the values of reading and writing, I mean, that was like up there with Jesus. So <laughs> <laughs> like that's- That's a first. Yeah. So, um, what's in Jesus? 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jesus and Arroz con Pollo. Those were all like on a level. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, Chanel, what about you? You know, I didn't really necessarily come from a family of big readers, um, but just ever since I was little, you know, I loved to read. And I remember my parents were really great about taking me to the library. You know, I, would, I was a kid that would go up to the checkout desk with, you know, the huge stack of books and the librarian would be like, are you going to read all of those? And I was like, yes, definitely. <laughs> like, I will be back next weekend. Yes. Yeah. Tomorrow, yeah. Um, so I think it just was always, you know, such a passion for me. I, I love the fact that books can kind of tra transport you anywhere. And yes. like I said before, such a great escape mm -hmm. and, and source of solace in, in difficult times. And writing just kind of evolved from that. You know, I think that um, once you read a ton, then you start to think, oh, what if I told, you know, my own story? Or what if I tried yes. this? And, and really, I found that it was something that I loved um, and really was just a, a wonderful creative outlet to have. That's awesome. That's so great. Well, ladies, thank you so much for being with us tonight and for just being so open and honest and sharing about your new books and your lives. And um, I know we all feel like we've just, it was such a treat to have you here and we've all gotten to know you better. So um, we can't wait for everyone to read your beautiful new novels and thank you for being here. Thank you for having Thanks. us. Yes. You are so the best. You really are. Yes. Thank you all. Tell Good night, us. ladies. Good night, thank ladies. You. All right, everyone. Now, don't forget, you can find all of our back episodes on YouTube. We're live there every week, just like we are on Facebook. And if you subscribe, you won't miss a thing. Plus, you'll have access to special short clips. So be sure to come back next week, same time, same place. And make sure right now to stay for the after show with Christina Lauren. Thank you for tuning in. You can join us every join us week every on week Facebook, on or, Facebook YouTube, or YouTube, where our live where show our live airs show on Wednesday airs nights on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Also, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Welcome to the after show. What a great night and more to come. Weren't they awesome? They oh were. my gosh. So one of the questions we didn't get to that was asked in the chat, once they want to know what you're drinking because it oh, looks Oh, like yeah. Well, I will say it's really just a good glass, um, <laughs> which, oh. you know, it's a pink, like Estelle, it's one of those Estelle colored glasses. I don't know if y'all have seen those. As seen on today, just like Mary Kay Andrews. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm actually drinking guava kombucha and it's quite delicious, but I'm not having it. Awesome. Like, Town, just, oh, that's awesome. know, but it's delicious. It looks good. Yeah, it was so fun to hear. And what I mean, and they they kind of simpatico the way they, yeah. you know, had to do the the research about these islands, yeah. right? Yeah, I kept wanting to ask them. Could you just say buy my book, damn it, in Spanish? <laughs> <laughs> they probably could have both done so. I've got to think they. I mean, Cuban and Puerto Rican, yeah. they must they definitely do that. that. They yeah. have got those skills for sure. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I love that. Well, guys, should we welcome on Christina Lauren? Are we we have yes. To. Yeah. So All right. Let's welcome Christina Hobbs and Lauren Billings. MKA, that's you. What? Oh. <laughs> I was waiting for them to come on camera. Oh, my we God. We have to introduce right. them first. Okay. <laughs> I'm new here. <laughs> they just released me from the home. Christina Lauren is the combined pen name of best friends and longtime writing partners and best friends. That was twice. That was not my fault. <laughs> that was twice. Christina Hobbs and Lauren Dillon. <laughs> the number one international best-selling duo <laughs> writes both young adult and adult fiction, and they're published in over 30 languages. They've been inducted into the Library Reads Hall of Fame. They've been nominated for several Goodreads Choice Awards, and they've been named Amazon and Audible Romance of the Year and a Lambda Literary Award finalist. My gosh, there's like so many things. It's amazing. I know. There's, oh, they're so great. They have also been featured in the Washington Post, Entertainment Weekly, and many other outlets. Lauren, who everyone calls Lo. That's what I call her, Lo. <laughs> As a PhD in neuroscience, 
and used to work in research. She is wearing a lab coat and goggles before she made writing her full-time job. Christina, who Lo calls PQ, <laughs> nicknames from them by the end of the night okay she used to work in a junior high counseling office but now she can be found at her desk writing or watching and i don't know what bts stands for that's, BTS. A, korean pop. that's a korean pop even i know that you know what patty because how did you get that caught in your lint trap i don't even know they've been on the today show and now she just oh, knows all right. things okay. today so their new novel, <laughs> Christina, we can read them in the chat. And Christina says, Patty, do not open that door. Oh, the seal is broken. Um, <laughs> so I mean, so <laughs> she knows when things drop. I am holla. never saying holla again. Oh, I said it. <gasps> when, when, when I try to be relevant, it doesn't work. Come <laughs> on, just talk about this. Their new novel, Something Wilder, hit stores on May 17th. All right. Welcome, Christina and Lauren. <laughs> if, if they come still want to come. come. <laughs> they still want to come. They're like, peace out. Oh, they're oh, hilarious. Yay. I'm just home. sitting backstage cracking up at you guys. <laughs> I'm like, don't ask us about BTS. The seal is broken. We'll no. start. <laughs> I will Google it when we're done because obviously I didn't mean to crack anything. But... No, Patty, I could be your Google. Like, tell me what you want to know, and I will okay. send all of you. Off the camera, we'll BTS for hours. I, okay. I can know all oh no, that. she Amazing. doesn't know what she says. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you guys are here. Welcome. Yeah, so we are so excited about the new book. So before we kind of dive in, can you guys tell us a little bit about something wilder? Yes. Okay. So first of all, I know we have the names, but I'm Lauren. She's Christina. Oh. <laughs> um, we write together as co-authors, obviously. So something wilder. This is a story um, that's kind of an homage to the adventure movies of our youth. So if you're a fan of Romancing the Stone or Indiana Jones, this is sort of right up your alley. This is a story of Leo Grady and Lily Wilder, and that is an homage to um, Joan Wilder from Romancing the Stone. I was going to say, it was Joan Wilder. <laughs> Joan Wilder. Yes, and they are former flames that have been separated due to circumstance over the last 10 years, and you'll obviously find out what that circumstance is. And um, they're thrown back together when Leo's group of guy friends books an expedition with Lily's adventure company, and her company takes tourists out into the Red Rock Canyon lands of Utah on these fake treasure hunts. So when everything goes sort of horribly wrong, they realize there might be real treasure out there and Leo and Lily have to decide if they trust each other enough to go after it. You had me at John Wilder. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now you two low and PQ for prom queen. Prom queen. <laughs> Wait, were you really the prom queen? No, no, no. no. So I she used just... to have very curly hair. Lo used to tease me about it. I'm giving my hair a me break too. for this summer. Me too. Her <laughs> nails are always perfect and her makeup. So I always call her prom queen. But it's a loving <laughs> term. It's not a jest. It like... Right. Okay. So you two, Lo and PQ, have been riding partners for over 10 years. But tell me, tell all of us how the two of you met. And what kind of reaction do you get when you have to break the news that you are, in fact, not one person, but <laughs> two halves of a dynamic writing duo? Um, anybody who has met us will not be surprised that we, we met writing fan fiction because we have fandom in our soul. We are the biggest fan girls <laughs> that ever lived. Um, so we were, met writing fan fiction. Lo was putting on a panel at San Diego Comic-Con in 2009. And I had a story online at the time. So she invited me to come and we just met and just hit it off and decided to write something together um very naively we wrote we wrote like a one shot like thick thing together and that was so fun so we were like let's write a book do you want to write a book together like that was the next <laughs> obvious step and <laughs> no no we it's were, not no yeah, no, we no. Very <laughs> lucky, not. So Mary King Andrews when 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 PQ came up and said do you want to write a book that would have been the end of whatever this story is <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, we didn't know better. We were so sort of just like innocently excited to collaborate. And I mean, I'm glad that we were sort of dummies in that way, because I think had we known like the obstacles that would meet us in publishing, yeah. we would have been like, no way. But but that's not the way fandom is. Like when you're writing fic, you're doing it just for the sure, the sheer love of something. You just are both crazy about the same thing. And so everybody reads everybody's story, yeah. everybody cool. edits, betas, you know, everything, everybody's work. So it just was like such a natural thing to do. So and yes, people are surprised every single day that there <laughs> are two of us. Every day I will send yeah. Lo a tweet that's like, I am today eight years old when I realized Christina Lauren is two people. <laughs> I love <laughs> Lauren. But that's or, just funny. I, you know, you want your books to feel like they've written been written by one person. Yeah, so it's such a compliment when people don't know. Yeah. yeah. Or it shows how like much the world is changing and how open things are that more and more people will say, Oh, I thought that they were just like non binary and they went by they. Like, and they were just totally fine with that. And I just love that so much. I just feel That's bad awesome. disappointing yep. them. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> you're like we are actually a plural day <laughs> like, yeah <laughs> yes actually plural so christina i know you you live in utah right yeah okay so can you talk about how you decided to set something wilder in utah have you set a book there before or was this a first for you um so our book autobiography oh, takes place. i knew that i've read that of course yeah yes. it takes place in provo utah and then um in the holidays takes place in Park City, Utah. And I don't think it was ever just like this, like conscious thing, like let's set some books in California where Lo lives, and let's set some books in Utah. It just sort of happens. We, um, we really love writing books where you feel like you can see everything around you and that you feel like you're yeah. in a movie. And that happens when you're usually really familiar with something. So yeah. um, if you've ever seen the opening scene of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, when um, young Indiana, who's River Phoenix, is out and it's just this beautiful vista of like red rocks. They're like Boy Scouts going in and they catch like somebody robbing, you know, a tomb or something. We wanted it to sort of feel like that. This just beautiful, gorgeous, um, just like it almost feels alien. It's so different yeah. from everything we're really used to. Um, so that's why we um, set it there. Um, I live in Utah, but I don't spend a lot of time in that area. Like my idea of camping would have like a chandelier. <laughs> same, same. <laughs> we live together. I like that. Mm -hmm. And room service too. Yes. And, well, and a Give champagne it. cooler. Obviously, yep. yes. Yeah. So why why yeah. camp without one? Yeah. Well, that would without saying. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. Um, so given that, was there any special research that went into writing this book? Yeah, so um, we found this canyoneering guide, and he was actually a scout for movie sets. So he would take Ooh, fancy people cool. out into the canyon lands and make them think they were going to die and then, like, miraculously save them. Um, <laughs> but he was really knowledgeable, obviously, about the area. He knew our story has a, sort of a subplot about Butch Cassidy's treasure and how some people believe and truly that the, this money that he hid in various places is still out there before he fled to Argentina. And so um, this guy, Philip, knew a lot about all of those legends. He knew the area really well. And so he created this map for us, this like fake treasure hunt. And it was way longer than when we ended up keeping in the book just because, I mean, you guys all know, like you, you, you have to take fictional, fictional license with some things. And it was just like, you know, we, they would have been out there for 14 days and it was just too long for the story. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so he wrote us like a list of things they'd have in their backpacks and what kinds of meals they would have out there and he, you know, plotted the course and it was really helpful. Oh, that's amazing. That's awesome. And so did he have a champagne cooler though? The most important <laughs> thing. I'm pretty sure he didn't. This is a very rustic man. And we like, <laughs> he gave us so much information. I mean, like pages and pages and pages and we could only use a fraction of it. So like our author's note at the beginning is basically like, we did all this research and we ignored a lot of it. And if you follow our path, you will die. <laughs> Do not do what we do say. Don't do try this in exactly. So you don't want it to be like wild where people like went and like did the, the actual. Yes. Right. Exactly. <laughs> he did say he took some very rich people and he, he like name dropped a little bit. But he took very, very like important people out to do these things. So that was exciting. Yeah. Ooh, cool. The, um, it, it, it makes me think like who would go do what Indiana Jones did? It's kind of self-evident that 
if we tried to go <laughs> to, to Indiana Jones journey, we I would most likely. I mean, none of us I would do it. it. No, the <laughs> pirate would remain unfound. Needless to say, if there are snakes involved, I I'm would most likely. I'm out. Die. Yeah. I'm out. Okay, back to something wilder and not Indiana Jones. This is a bit of a departure from what you usually write. There's still a lot of romance, like your other novels, but there's a lot more action and adventure. Did you want to write, like, did you say this is going to be an adventure novel? And if you did, like, why now? Why now is the time that you said this is this is what we want to do? I don't know that we necessarily set out, like, we want this to be super different. But what we did want is for it to be fun. Um, so oh, we okay, sat great. down to write in the in the beginning of 2021, Lowe's in California. So most of California was still in like a really serious lockdown. And we just could not imagine writing something that took place in a coffee shop or an office yeah. or something. So we just wanted to be outside and we wanted to have an adventure, even if it just was Love through it. our characters. Um, but so of course it did end up being bigger. It did end up being fun. There's like car chases and, and all, you know, people almost die and that kind of thing. But um, I read this review once that was like, I keep seeing that this book is so different, but it's different in the way that like autobiography is different. The love in other words is different. The Josh yeah. Hazel is different than, yeah. you know, and the holidays. Is. And so I sort of love that, that our readers have let us do all of these different things. Well, when you decided we want this to have more adventure, I'm just curious because of uh, the dynamic between you two, like, can you even go back and say, oh, that was her idea. That was her idea. That was her idea. Because I know when we try to go back, wait, whose idea was that? Wait, yeah. who that? Like, can you even say who yes said? Yes and no. I mean, the overall idea for this book was Christina's. We had initially thought of doing it as like a screenplay and an early idea of it was that Leo was the cowboy that was sort of down and out. Mm -hmm. And Lily was the city girl that had had to leave him to go take care of her little sister after a tragedy. And we started writing that version in the book. And like, I was writing Lily's point of view as the city girl. And I was like, I am home with two kids doing virtual school. My husband is working upstairs. I like cannot work for 20 minutes before somebody needs something. And I don't <laughs> want to write about a woman who's put her life on hold for to take care of family. So we gender oh, I love it. that you could be honest about that. That is yeah. so great. Yeah. I mean, I think we just kept writing the chapter and rewriting and I didn't know why it wasn't working. I realized that's why. And so when we gender swapped it, um, it was just like everything kind of unscrolled from there. So I think once we got into it, the ideas are all shared and it happens just this magic when we're in the room together, this collaboration of just like talking through stuff and figuring out how to plot these things. But the initial concept of this one, yeah, I like we knew it was Christina, but most of the time it's very collaborative, you know. That's amazing. And that yeah. you were willing, Christina, to say that was my idea, but sure, but it's not working for you. Let's gender swap it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we just wanted to do something fun. I mean, seriously, yeah. we just wanted somebody. Number one, this was the funnest thing we have ever written. Awesome. It's like at the end of it, we were just like, holy cow, that feels almost like we cheated because it yeah, was so, it was so fun. fun. And we've written a lot of books together and had a lot of fun and made each other laugh and surprised each other and stuff. So for this to be so fun and so different was just, you know. It was like it was a tree romance or something, you know, and um, uh, yeah, we just wanted it to be fun. We wanted people at the end to close the book and just be like, whoa, I was not <laughs> expecting that. The way you felt when you watched Romancing the Stone. Yeah. You know, like if anybody has seen The Lost City, that. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I love that movie. <laughs> I love every Indiana Jones movie. Oh, yeah. And this is, we say this is like Indiana Jones, but with more kissing. More kissing. Oh, I love it. I love it. Oh. I actually think that's like the quote to end on. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, ladies, we are. Oh, Mary Kay, you're. you're I'm muted. sorry. I'm, I was just, I'm sorry. I muted because my dogs were barking. That could be like flap copy. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. Indiana Jones, but with more <laughs> kissing. More kissing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag. Um, well, speaking of being big fan girls, we are big fan girls. We are fan girls. 
We should write fan fiction of their book. I love it. No, she did not, did she? She did. I'm sorry. sorry. I think she thought she was muted. No, I didn't. She did. I said. (laughs) We are big fangirls of both of you. And um, we are so excited about this book. We cannot wait for everyone to read it. So thank you so much for joining us. And everyone out there, thank you so much for being a part of our Friends of Fiction family. And don't forget that Something Wilder, our last days in Barcelona and Mustique Island, as well as books by the four of us, are available on our bookshop.org page. And we cannot wait to see you next week right here. Same time, same place. See you then. Good night. Good night.